Hello, I'm Paul Richards with the latest from science. We know that older people are at most acute risk from COVID-19, but what is the threat faced by children? Dr. Asher Bowen is a paediatrician and infectious disease expert from the Telethon Kids Institute in Western Australia, and also works at the Perth Children's Hospital. Dr. Bowen, thanks for your time. Thank you. Now, children seem to be impacted less severely by COVID-19. Is that really the case and why? Well, from what we can tell from international studies, there are fewer children um, who have been documented to have COVID-19 than their proportion of the population. So it seems that there are fewer affected and they have a milder um, disease when that occurs. So a about 95% of children who've been diagnosed with COVID-19 have had a milder um, form of the disease than, say, adults have been experiencing and what has been making the media. Um, some children are still um, contracting the virus. Um, are their symptoms any different? Are there different things to look out for? On the whole, kids' symptoms are the same as adults. Uh, and a respiratory illness that seems to have not as much of a snotty nose and more of a cough, a sore throat, and then progresses on to having a pneumonia. So children can get just as sick as adults, but on the whole, proportionally, there are far fewer children getting very, very sick with COVID-19. What about at-risk children, perhaps children with, with underlying health conditions? I suppose they're still um, uh, just as much at risk as they would be from other viruses as well. Yeah, so we know that children who have uh, um, other medical problems are more susceptible to getting more unwell when they get any sort of respiratory illness. So we know every year when um, kids get influenza, if they already have a chronic medical condition, then they are more likely to end up in our hospitals. That being said, we've got not that much data yet from even all the international studies that children have been more um, with, I guess, background medical problems, more likely to end up in hospitals. But I know for parents with these children, it is a great concern. And I think that the reassuring part of it is that our hospitals are ready to care for those children. And the paediatric hospitals and the hospitals across Australia have lots and lots of experience caring for these children every year during flu season. And we're ready to care for these children this year as well. There are some younger children and, and teenagers who have sadly died from the virus. Do we know much about those cases? We're putting together, I guess, an understanding of children who die from um, COVID-19, and it's probably less than 15 children globally. Most of those have appeared in the media um, and in social media or in national statistics and not necessarily in published or peer-reviewed um, literature as yet. So I, I guess we're trying to understand it as much as possible in this world of social media and rapid turnaround of information and figure out what that means for children. We have been hearing, I think, over the last week or so of teenagers who have died who had no medical problems um, coming into the experience of COVID-19 and have passed away in the UK and France um, from social media and from media reports. As yet, they haven't been published in the peer-reviewed literature. In China, there was a few um, children, predominantly who had an underlying medical problem, who have um, died of, of COVID-19. So globally, the numbers are very small compared to what we're seeing with adults, but it doesn't mean that children are completely safe from this virus. Okay. We've had an email sent in to us by Fran Malloy. Um, Fran asks, could our isolation have other benefits like lower rates of colds and flu this season? I suspect Fran's on the money. So the fact that we're um, social distancing, that we're washing our hands, we're catching our coughs, means that it's highly likely we'll have a milder um, influenza season. We're still very much recommending that people get their flu vaccines, which are just coming online uh, this month, and to make sure that they have the best possible protection from influenza, because every year we know that about 8% of children who get influenza end up in our intensive care units. So we definitely want to prevent that from happening. Um, so the flu shot reminds just as important, but all of the social distancing measures mean that we probably will see a milder respiratory virus season this coming year. The flu vaccine is being offered earlier than usual, as you just mentioned, but why should people arrange to have it now and, and why has that been brought forward? Uh, I think we've, we traditionally... Um, 
give the flu vaccine about now. And then in the last two years, we've tried to push it back a little bit to try and match the um, immunity and protection you get from the flu vaccine with the actual flu season in different states. Last year, we had a very early flu season and it took us by surprise with COVID-19. We want to make sure that we have the best possible protection as early as possible. So now's the time to go and get the flu shot. Um, if you're in one of the groups that is funded, such as the over 65, um, six months to five years are funded this year on the national program. And in some of the states, um, school aged children are also funded. Now, there are still a number of childcare centres that are open around the country. Should parents consider them safe for their children? Um, that's a great question, and it really intersects between the science, the policy, and the public perception. And so I think that uh, from what we know of childhood to childhood transmission of COVID-19, there are not that many cases um, reported where children are affecting other children. We know every season that we blame the children for the colds that come out of daycare and out of school settings and even influenza. And we know that that actually is transmitted heavily by school age children and from daycare centres. In fact, COVID-19 does not seem to be behaving the same way as influenza and other respiratory viruses. And fewer than 10% uh, of children in household transmission clusters were the index case in a study that we've just completed. So that's probably about a 40% drop to, compared to what we might see with influenza. So um, children in daycare centres, I think, are safe to be there. I think that um, each family needs to make the best decision for their family. And the, for healthcare workers, we really do want them to remain on the front line and other um, frontline workers and to provide a safe environment for their kids to be. So the daycare centres are really implementing all of the social distancing and um, hand washing and respiratory etiquette things that they possibly can do, bearing in mind that toddlers are um, often known as terrorists and um, have trouble um, behaving and doing the things that we expect adults to do. So they're doing a lot more cleaning and um, a lot more um, individualised care in order to make it as safe as possible for those parents who do need to use daycare at the moment. Well, many of us have heard the suggestion to sing happy birthday twice when washing your hands. Do you have any other tips for parents to teach children good hygiene? Um, well, I think Happy Birthday is going to be the most popular song for the year. And um, I do think that watching your children wash their hands, making sure that they have an adequate amount of soap on their hands, which is, is really one squirt of a, of a soap um, dispenser or um, rubbing them all over with um, a, a soap bar, and then making sure that they uh, pay attention to all the bits of their hands. So I'm going to show you my hands and making sure that they're getting in between the little bits even around their wrists, getting in the middle where they often catch their coughs and making sure that their hands are as clean as possible. So I think as parents and as um, um, care workers, either in daycare centres or schools, um, we have been paying a lot of attention to the song. We also need to pay a lot of attention to what our kids are doing while they're singing and make sure that they're doing a great job of washing their hands. And just finally, in terms of advice of when to wash hands, I mean, it makes sense <clears throat> to do it prior to eating food. Are there other times that, that perhaps um, is a good time to wash hands? So we recommend washing hands uh, regularly, and that also includes after coughing or sneezing, after um, obviously using the bathroom, going to um, to the toilet. And also um, I think it's a good idea to, when you come home from a, um, a social um, opportunity, be that the shops, be that the, um, the school, obviously we're having very few social opportunities, but when you're out with the public, um, making sure that when you come back into the home um, and you have access to somewhere to wash your hands, that's a great idea. So um, there's never enough moments at the moment to wash your hands. Dr. Asher Bowen, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Good to chat. Joining me on Friday is Professor Rhina McIntyre from the University of New South Wales. She's on the scientific panel advising the federal government, so is well positioned to walk us through the scientific modelling being used to inform decisions. I'm Paul Richards. See you then. <laughs>